week's special edition, we are featuring aspiring women entrepreneurs on the continent. Hello, I am Stella Monica Mpande. Bi-weekly, we strive to bring you stories that inspire, empower, engage, and motivate young African entrepreneurs using new technology into action. In many countries around the world, women remain marginalized and an untapped source of economic potential. According to the International Labor Organization, there are 812 million women living in developing countries with the potential to contribute more fully to their economies. This week, we present to you a fascinating and inspiring story about a Ghanaian woman who quit her corporate job in the United States and moved back to West Africa to launch a lifestyle brand for natural products. Since returning to her home country, Nana Amayanka has turned her passion into a profitable business. Paul, please share her story with us. Dry skin moisturizes. It's been said that uh, being passionate about your work is uh, the key to success. Nana Amayanka is no exception. It was her passion that uh, triggered her to start a Naya Natural Lifestyle brand for natural products. And uh, she has literally turned her brother's garage into a mini factory. This raw shea butter. So we melt it and then we filter it before we actually Where do you use it. get a raw shea butter? From the north. I call them up and they send me some. Nana says that using shea butter in various products is a business that she has had in mind for the last five years. So as you can tell, it's pretty much gone from oil to white because of the emulsifiers in there and also just the water. What I'm going to do next is add in the, first the preservative, because when you mix oil and water and you don't put any preservative in it, it's actually going to mold. Yes, so I'm adding some color to be able to make the product. Nana says that many commercial creams are irritated her sensitive skin. And that's when she developed the idea to start making her own product line from local and imported materials. Butter that's been mixed with coconut oil. It smells good. Yes, and we mix in the essential oils. Regarding her own technical knowledge of the shea butter making process, Nana admits that she didn't have any formal training or background in chemistry, but she certainly does now. I am not a chemist by any measure. Like any startup company, it's not without its challenges. For example, getting her product line certified and approved by the Ghana Standards Authority took a long time. And of course, the constant problem with power blackouts. But despite these hurdles, she has a very positive attitude. I wanted to start something. I'm always one of those people that I've, I like to do things. I like to start things. I like to try things. I do that with food. I do that with, you know, products. I do that with different things. So why not start my own business? Naya natural products can be found in several local Ghanaian shopping malls, at fairs and exhibitions. They deliver locally and sell and ship internationally. Our goal is to make products that people can identify with. They know what it is, natural products from things that we find around us or products that have been around us but have not been improved over time. We want to be able to take them and improve on them. Although there are many body care products on the market, making shea butter creams can be a perfect business opportunity if you have the right people to market the product. They have no side effects, actually, because there are no chemicals in them that are harmful. Okay. They don't bleach, they don't make you dark. They just help maintain your natural skin color, whether fair or dark. Cosmetic experts say shea butter has qualities that make it a popular ingredient in many cosmetic supplies, lotions, and other skincare products. Also from West Africa, from Senegal, Celebrity philanthropist Marianne Jam is a London-based CEO, blogger, technologist, and social entrepreneur committed to empowering her fellow Africans through education, leadership, entrepreneurship, and economic development. Now let us hear from Paul Ndiho, our African innovation technology reporter who's caught up with her 
about her latest role as co-founder of Africa Gathering. Technology is quite, it's very important for the world, uh, you know, including Africa. And Africa need to have access to technology, access to information. Uh, you know, we have innovators in the continent and technology is booming. So I don't see why not. Uh, we should have the technology, really. What do you think needs to be done uh, to empower these young people who are into innovation and technology? I think what needs to be done is to catalyze them, to make sure we believe in them, to create a market, uh, to make sure that we, uh, you know, we understand, we mentor them, we give them, you know, we guide them, give them some tools, and give them an ecosystem to, um, you know, to develop themselves. Uh, that's what we need really to develop this industry, which uh, will be, uh, which will be booming in the continent. Too far from Senegal, we now travel to Nigeria, where women in Lagos who like to shop but are worried about what to wear and their makeup now have a new way to help them look chic, hot, and more attractive. Why go out on a shopping spree in Lagos when the mobile fashion store can bring a shopping spree directly to your doorstep? Africa Innovation and Technology Channel reporter Charlotte Intirejo can tell us more. Fashion on Wheels has rolled into town and it's giving women a shopping experience right at their doorsteps. Early morning rush hour in Nigeria's commercial capital of Lagos and 25-year-old Alari Ajay is maneuvering her old white truck through notoriously congested streets. Ajay left her job at a marketing company in London in 2011 to set up the business selling clothing and fashion accessories from the trunk of her car. I just figured, you know, I need something that is, that the people can enjoy the experience while shopping. You know, it's hot in the, the climate in Nigeria is one that you can't stand outside for too long, you know, without feeling so hot. So I just thought, you know what, let me get something big um, with an AC, the clothes are hung. And I thought, why not just have my shop on wheels, you know, the rates in Nigeria right now are just so alarming, you know, so I didn't even bother considering a shop. I just wanted something mobile. I can change my location any day. I can, I'm not restricted to one area. This year, she bought an old truck and turned it into a mobile walk-in closet that is fully stocked with hand-picked, imported merchandise from Britain and America. The truck even has a built-in fitting room. Ajay says the business has grown in popularity, mainly due to the fact that unlike location stores, she can meet her customers at their point of need, so to speak, rather than wait for them to come to her. We don't necessarily have bad days except when it's raining and we can't really like open the truck um, on like a shop where you could, you know, still operate, even though nobody would really attend, you know, but um, there's no competition really. The mobile boutique has impressed many like first-time customer Felicia Okopala, who is often too busy to spend time in traffic or go into town to shop. The concept is beautiful. This is, for me, this is the first time I'm seeing this and it's um, for, for this to be happening in Nigeria. I, mean, I don't know if it's happening anywhere else, but coming to Lagos, I think it's fantastic. It's a great idea. Ajay, who also owns a clothing store in one of Lagos' fashion districts, hopes to expand Fashion on Wheels in the next few years to include more trucks that can cater for customers living in other parts of Nigeria. Charlotte Interejo, reporting for Africa Innovation and Technology Channel. We'll take a short break, but before we go, we want to know what you think about the Africa Innovation and Technology Channel and the stories we cover. Join the conversation on Twitter and Facebook. Also. Check us out on our YouTube channel. topic of fashion and innovation, let us meet Ugandan fashion designer, Gloria Wavamuno, who has always been a fashion fanatic. She is the founder and artistic director of her own label, Gloria, 
and today her use of the African Katanga fabric has made her one of Africa's top young designers as she makes her mark in the fashion industry. Charlotte Intirejo has our report. Hi, I'm Gloria Wavamuno and welcome to Composite. Gloria Wavamuno launched her clothing label in 2009. Since then, she has stirred up quite a buzz on the global fashion scene. Wavamuno has participated in the London, New York, and Johannesburg Fashion Weeks, showcasing innovative, unique, and cutting-edge fashion designs. Her works have also been featured in the prestigious Arise magazine. From 13, I would make you know, little tank tops or little dress or dresses from African fabric. So it carried on with me to where I started to use it within my own brand when I started. Wavamano's fascination with fashion and a love for raw African fabric started when she was a young girl. And now she competes with some of the biggest names in the African fashion industry. Arise magazine says the rising designers' collections are known for their uniqueness and amazingly sharp cuts. But Wavamano also manages to maintain the eccentric, romantic feel of the garment. She accomplishes this with a smooth mesh between the use of African fabrics, transformed into stylish pieces of contemporary African wear. I do hope that my brand does evolve and it changes with the time because I think we're in a, a period in, in the world that everything is changing and evolving at a rapid speed. Um, for the good, and I just hope that my brand is able to kind of tap into that whole change and be able to evolve. Wavamano attributes her success to her parents and other supporters who pushed her to pursue her dream in the African fashion industry. I'm very lucky. I've had wonderful role models in my life with very encouraging words as I was growing up. And um, one thing I think my mom said to me when I was really young that stuck through and kind of embodies a lot of what my brand is based on is that if it doesn't start with you, then who will it start with? And that basically is also a reason for coming home and, and why I've also always wanted to come home even when I was studying abroad. Since the creation of Gloria, Wavamano has worked tirelessly to release a new collection every season, showcasing her best work in a very tough environment. Wavamuno notes that young African designers can play a significant role and be part of the change that will boost development and growth on the continent. I do want it to be a brand that is seen like any big international brand that people from all kinds of life and cultures can embrace it and want to wear it. And, um, yeah, I just, um, I just hope for growth really. It's important for uh, that we will be part of the movement and the, the change that will come within Africa because as much as we know, we can also educate other people abroad on what really is happening here. Like other African fashion entrepreneurs that are based on the continent, she uses local, regional, and continental expos to highlight and sell her brands. Fashion analysts say the industry has tremendous potential to meet the growing demand for high-end products in the global market including Africa's growing middle class. As the Gloria label expands and makes its mark in the fashion world, other African designers are looking forward to expressing their creativity in the marketplace as well. Charlotte Interejo reporting for Africa Innovation and Technology Channel. Now come with me to Western Uganda, where more than 200 women who comprise the Rubona Basket Weavers Association are using naturally dyed raffia to make baskets of all shapes and sizes. These baskets are then sold to international markets. African innovation and tech reporter Paul Ndiho recently visited the women and filed this report. Baskets have long been part of Ugandan culture and our women here still use the traditional ones are known as echivo to carry various goods. Here at Rubona Basket Weavers Association, an outlet on the outskirts of Fort Potro, Uganda, women are trained and dedicated to weaving basket masterpieces. They use naturally dyed rufia to make their products. Karen Kaganzi is the sales manager at Rubona Basket Weavers Association. She explains the process. Out of this plant, we get maroon, we get yellow and brown. From this plant, we use the we use the tubers, the roots. 
About 200 women work here. They produce and sell about 500 baskets each month. This is a very successful project that is self-sustaining and contributes to the economic independence of the local women in the region. These women here have developed a way of incorporating modern designs into traditional basket weaving and sell their work at reasonable prices. Uh, this is a pot basket for smaller clothes. Um, but this is a uh, These are pen holders for pens in the office. Uh, this is a bowl. This is for fruits and decoration. One can use it for fruits and one for decoration. To make quality baskets, uh, the weavers select different plants and then extract their leaves or roots. These are then dried and dried. The weavers bring out a unique colored patterns as the basket shapes from the center. A 12-inch diameter basket takes about a week to complete. The baskets are used for storage or put up as wall hangings. Karen says it took years of research and experiments until a wide range of colors were obtained from local plants. The most recent additions to the color palette are blue from the indigo plant and black from the back of the water tree. The women work in their fields in the garden. Yeah, but when they are free, when they, are, uh, they, are, uh, they, they, are, they have come from their gardens, they work on their baskets. Oh, this is a side gate. The project is owned and run by the local women. The income goes directly to the local women to meet their basic needs. Once the handcrafts are finished, they are carefully packed for shipping. Baskets in Uganda were traditionally used to store food and as decorations during weddings and even to ferry secrets from one woman to another. Though, through the Rwanda Basket Weavers Association, these women can earn a living but the effectiveness of the group will only be determined once they live and put up the skills they have learned here to the test by running their own businesses. So you know how you've heard the phrase, one man's trash is another man's treasure? Well, this phrase has taken on a whole new literal meaning, this time by rural women in Kenya who are converting garbage into valuable fuel for cooking purposes. Although many Africans, especially in rural areas, use charcoal for cooking, they have noted that the effects over the years have been disastrous for the continent's forests and overall environment. A response to this crisis is found in Kenya, where an energy-saving cooking stove fueled entirely by trash is making a buzz in both the local and international scene. Paul Ndiho, our Africa Innovation and Technology Channel reporter, can enlighten us with the story. A revolutionary cooker invented in Kenya and powered entirely by garbage has won several international ingenuity awards. The giant stove has transformed the lives of people living in several poor communities in the East African country. Now, orders for the cooker are flowing in from abroad as far as Britain and Bali. Families used to spend hours bending over a hot, smoky charcoal stove while preparing their meals. The stove uses plastic bags, food cartons, cardboard boxes, old clothes, and other discarded rubbish are found in slums in and around Naivasha, a market town located in Kenya's Rift Valley region. The giant furnace burns plastics and other garbage at 800 degrees centigrade and the energy generated is then used to fuel a giant cooker. The homegrown rubbish burning stove was introduced to the community six months ago and already it has helped to provide a cleaner environment and a faster, cheaper way for people to cook food. It saves me money because I don't use paraffin. I come here with my food, I cook, and then I go home. The stove was invented by architects at a design firm planning system services in Nairobi, getting the cooker to heat the rubbish at temperatures higher enough to burn off any noxious forms took several years to perfect. A prototype for the cooker was finally built last year and since then the design has picked up several international innovation awards. 
Janes Muthai, who heads the foundation set up to run the project, says the interest it has attracted internationally has been great for the company. But persuading people that garbage can be used as a fuel is always a challenge. We know that it's sound and, you know, the technology is sound and, you know, we're getting all these awards, international awards, because they really do believe in the technology. But now what we really need to do is to get the community on board. And, you know, of course, we've had uh, issues with people thinking rubbish, cooking my food. I mean, my old socks could actually be making my next meal, you know. So those are the kind of things that we've had to try and overcome and uh, we're still working on that. The first people to buy into the idea were owners of a flower farm in Naivasha. The farm generates a lot of waste and many of the workers live in nearby slums where people are often forced to live alongside piles of trash. The farm bought a cooker to help improve lives of its workers and bring the fair trade company in line with international eco-friendly standards. David Musioka from the flower farm says it has been so transformative for his community and that he hopes the idea will spread to other parts of the country. If it can be built every, everywhere in Kenya, if we can get this, everywhere will be clean. So far there are two cookers operating in Naivasha and another one in Nairobi's Kibera slum. Environmentalists say this could potentially change the way people use the traditional means of cooking because it's cleaner and cheaper. Kenya is among the countries that are looking to develop its geothermal, wind, solar, hydroelectric power and its homegrown fuel-efficient cookstove. Still to come on the African Innovation and Technology Channel are rice farming in the Ivory Coast and Malian women who are transforming shea butter into money. We'll take a short break. <music> Innovation and Technology Channel, a show where we strive to bring you stories that inspire, empower, engage, and motivate young African entrepreneurs into action. A new rice variety is transforming agriculture in the Ivory Coast, benefiting hundreds of farmers, mostly women. During harvest time in the Ivory Coast, this new brand of rice is not destined for the dinner table. It's a new, more hearty brand of rice, and this woman's cooperative is producing high-quality seeds for sale that go to a seed bank. Paul and Diho, please tell us the story. It is harvest time in Ivory Coast, but this rice is not destined for the dinner table. It's a new, more handy breed of rice. And this women's cooperative is producing high-quality seeds for sale to a seed bank. In a country reeling from civil war, these farmers are helping to reduce poverty. Before, it was only suffering, suffering, suffering. We could not find any food to eat. But now, selling these right seeds, we can buy food and we are doing well. Some 800 farmers in Ivory Coast have been trained to grow a more productive and pest-resilient breed of rice and with it have almost doubled their yields and profits. Gendea is a widow with three children, and her group is growing wheat and nine rice. She says the new rice has meant more earnings and independence in a country where women grow over half of the food, but they rely on men for access to land. Thanks to this rice, I can build a house, rent a tractor and can do what men can do. Now we are the same as men. To ensure the seeds are of high quality, Gendea needs a government certificate and must adhere to strict regulations, from the choice of the terrain and to the correct way of drying the seeds. At least 30 rice producers attended an intensive training course 
and had an opportunity to share experiences with fellow rice growers. All seeds here are sent to a government warehouse. Here, the machines separate the good grains from the bad. After a final quality check, they are stored until the next planting season, when they can be distributed to thousands of farmers. Analysts say that for Ivorian rice farmers to reach their full potential, political stability must continue in the country, and the government should continue to invest in agricultural research. Still in Francophone Africa, Mali has recently taken steps to its shade trees that will benefit millions. The fruit from these trees can be used to make soaps and other cosmetic products that are popular in foreign markets. Once again, Paul Ndiho has our report. Mamul Kuruble and Fatumata Tangara know all about the benefits of the shade tree. Like thousands of other women in Mali, they've been gathering its fruit for years in order to produce soaps and other products. The sheet tree grows wild throughout the vast country, but here in Kimeni it remains a source of natural wealth that is not being utilized to the fullest. Women in Mali face many challenges in transporting the sheep fruit to places where it can be stored and processed. Mamu is fortunate because she can borrow her husband's cut, but others aren't so lucky. Challenges remain even after the fruit from the she tree has been delivered to a processing center. Nini Taure works in Sugu in southern Mali. This center uses 800 liters of water per day, and it all has to be pumped from the ground, 10 liters at a time, and carried to where the women work. It's an energy sapping process that often leaves women too tired for the remaining labor intensive tasks. Um, Two problems we are confronted with here are the water situation and the fact that we have to mix everything by hand. This new project is seeking to help women become more productive so they will be able to make their businesses more profitable. It's administered by the governments of Mali and Luxembourg in conjunction with the United Nations Industrial Development Organization, or UNIDO. The center employs 20 women who process the sheep fruit are gathered by more than 2,500 women spread across 32 area villages. Just a year ago, the center could only produce 100 kilos of soap per day. Now, it can produce 600. And the emphasis is on quality as well as quantity. A better product means a better life for the workers. The soap has changed greatly. Before, we didn't know what was in it. Now, we make soap that is purely vegetable, and we know that it is good for our health. Higher productivity means higher wages for the workers, allowing the women to spend more of their money where it matters most. At this local school in Doyala, the classes are full. More children are attending class if their parents are able to pay the required fees and don't need them to work and assist the family financially. The support given to the women outside the capital is part of a government policy to combat poverty in rural areas of the country. Women work with she in all forms, from the north to the south and from the east to the west. Nowadays, there is a question of quality with she. We are trying to improve that with the new techniques. Analysts are hoping that the more value the women of Mali can add to their product, the more profit they will be able to make. And if the improvements here can be duplicated across the country, Many other women in Mali have something to celebrate in the future. Ladies and gentlemen, that is our show today. Be sure to watch the Africa Innovation and Technology channel online every two weeks. And remember, check us out on our YouTube channel. Thank you for watching. For now, so long from Washington, D.C.